Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Thank you for joining our session on the NICV satellite data program. Um, my name is Charlotte Bishop. Uh, I work for KSAT, and I'm also the program lead for the NICV satellite data program. Uh, and in fact, the whole team is here, so I will do some introductions a bit as, as we go through uh, the session today. Um, but, uh, but, but firstly, before we start, um, we've got a few people in the room, maybe we'll have some more join us as they come back from lunch, but I'm interested, how many here have already used the NICFI satellite data program? Your hand up. Okay, so maybe two-thirds of the room have used the program. Okay, th this, this is good. Um, so for those who have used the program, this will provide some updates on perhaps some, some new uh, capabilities, new partners that we're working with, but also some very interesting case examples from country representatives. Um, and for those who haven't heard about the program, you get all of that and more. You get to, to learn a little bit more about what this program is and does and potentially how it can help you as well. So, uh, this program is perhaps a little bit different, uh, sorry, this session is perhaps a little bit different to some of the other side events we've had in this program. Um, we actually have a live technical demonstration as well to show you how some of some of these tools work online, um, but, but also we really do encourage your questions and feedback when we get to the Q&A session at the end. So all of the presenters who are either demonstrating or speaking, um, we will do the speaking part of the program first and then we'll do the panel session at the end, very similar to the other sessions. So very quickly, I just want to introduce the, hang on, there we go, uh, the agenda for today's session. Um, so we will shortly introduce um, Karina from NICFI, who will speak about um, uh, NICFI's role in this program as the funders for this program. Uh, I will give a bit of background and overview to, to the program, what it is, what it does, how you can access it, and a few updates for those who are quite familiar with the program. Uh, we will then have Eric from FAO giving us a demonstration and looking at some of these, digging into the weeds a little bit with some of the different tools available through FAO's open forest tools. Uh, and then we're delighted to have three country representatives today from Ecuador, Lao PDR, and Uganda, who are going to share their experiences of using this data. Um, so I think it's going to be a really nice panel session, really good discussion, and yeah, please do save your questions. We have, uh, I hope, some ample time at the end for that. So without further ado, um, and so we can try and keep to time, I would like to introduce Karina Hertzberg, who is a senior advisor at NICFI, which is Norway's international, and climate, uh, international Climate and Forest Initiative. Karina, over to you. Thank you so much, Charlotte, and um, it's great to be here. I'm very pleased to participate in uh, one of a row of very good events during, uh, for the Satellite Data Program. And it's also very welcome to um, have the opportunity to speak about uh, NICFI and the background for, for why we took this initiative and um, the experiences that we see so far. So, I expect that a lot of you know NICFI quite well, uh, but it's um, Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative is both Norway's largest international climate change initiative and it's Norway's largest biodiversity initiative. It's under the Ministry for Climate and Environment. It was launched by the Norwegian government in 2008 and will be running until 2030 at least. This is through a parliamentary decision. Um, we have an annual budget of about three, million, three billion Norwegian kroner to help protect the world's tropical forests while improving the livelihoods of those living there. And we work um, on a very broad arena. We work to bring together governments, businesses, indigenous peoples and civil society to help protect the world's remaining tropical forests. There are three main objectives, keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees and the absolutely essential role that forests play in that. Protecting biodiversity, and there's a huge overlap when it comes to carbon storage and biodiversity in, in forests, and pursue sustainable development. And to 
implement these three overarching objectives, we have seven strategic areas, sustainable land use policies, deforestation free commodity markets, addressing forest crimes, transforming the financial sector, protecting and securing rights of indigenous peoples, and using carbon markets to scale up financial support. And finally, transparency. And I guess, it, needless to say to the audience at the DO4I, um, transparency is key to all of these other issues, all of the other target areas for NICV. Where, when, and why deforestation and forest degradation is happening is really a key enabler for progress on all of these other areas. And it's also why we decided to initiate the satellite data program. High resolution satellite images were available before this program was launched in 2020, but it was expensive, it was sort of scattered and only available to a few for those reasons. Um, and in our work with um, tropical forest countries, civil society, a lot of the, this broad range of actors that we had contact with, uh, but in particular the forest country governments, we found out that there, 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 there was a need for this um, high resolution satellite imagery, it could fill important gaps, it could make it possible to do much um, more rapid advances. So we t decided to do a pilot on making high resolution satellite imagery freely accessible to everyone. And that's our starting point as a principle that this data should be a global common good. And I like to add that this perspective of open access of data as global common good is also the approach of the GFI. So it fits very well with the GFI. And GFI partners are among the most active participants and contributors to making use of the satellite imagery, such as the CPOL project, which we'll hear more about. Um, the actual program is uh, initiated through a contract uh, worth up to approximately 43 million US dollars with KSAT, uh, with Charlotte here as the project lead, and the partners Airbus and Planet. It's um, public procurement, so we're buying the service of providing free access to high resolution satellite imagery. That was quite a, a novel form of public procurement for Norway, so it was a major process. Uh, we're happy to share the experience. <laughs> um, the um, contract for the program was extended earlier this year for its final year, which will, uh, and it will then run until September 2024 users will be able to continue using the data that the program has made available um, also after the, the termination of, the, of this contract. Um, we will learn more about this, um, but some of the key elements uh, that I'd like to mention is the um, incredible growth in, in users, more than 18,000 registered users across the globe. Uh, and that's just those that are registered users on the platform. Many more are, are, are getting the benefit of this data through platforms such as Global Forest Watch and the Google Earth Engine. So the actual number of users is way bigger. Uh, users come from 158 countries around the world uh, using data from 97 tropical countries, basically covering all of the tropical forest areas of the world. And the feedback we received um, in events such as this through reporting is that it has in many respects been a game changer in understanding and responding to deforestation. Um, governments of forest countries are leading the way and uh, also civil society, private sector, media, indigenous peoples and the research community are using the data in, in different but impactful ways. And the use of the data uh, has been uh, somehow as expected, but we've also seen some unexpected and surprising and really interesting uses of the data. Uh, so f governments are using uh, the data for improving their national forest monitoring, understanding the drivers and validating deforestation alerts, um, to enforce regulations and to be able to effectively uh, implement legislation. Private sector use the data in their efforts towards deforestation-free supply chains, relevant not just to their voluntary commitments, but even more so with the upcoming regulation in the EU. 
And we have seen a number of examples of media using the data in very impactful investigative journalism. So I'll uh, close uh, now, very much look forward to hearing more about the experiences, see the possibilities of uses, but also see the, the range, some of the tools of how to make the best use of this satellite uh, data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina. Uh, I think that was a, a very nice way to start this session, to provide some context and, and some reasoning as to what's led to this program, um, and who better than to, for, for, for Nick Fee to present that directly. So thank you very much again, Karina. So it, it falls to me to just do, do a very brief introduction to the program, a reminder, as I, as I mentioned, um, or perhaps it's the first time that you've seen this. So for, for those uh, small number in the room who maybe haven't come across this program, I hope this information is helpful. And, and if you have more questions, please take the time to ask them towards the end or come and find us. We will still be here uh, during the exhibition session as well at the end of the day. So I wanted to start kind of building on what Karina was saying in terms of the reasonings behind what led to this program. I think this was a really nice visual example. Um, we work in Earth observation, satellite imagery. We're quite visual people. Um, and I think this, this is, is something I think quite encapsulates really the, what we're talking about here when we're talking about what a Norway has invested in in this program. So the image on the, the left-hand side of, of the screen as you're looking at it uh, is a Landsat image. So 30 meter pixels. Uh, very long historical archive back to the 1970s and has been used traditionally particularly since 2008 when the data became public um, for a, a range of different environmental monitoring and monitoring in general um, and and then we can compare that to the image on the right hand side which is the imagery that we have within the program so this is five meter spatial resolution data so really quite a step change in terms of the level of detail that we can extract from the imagery and therefore when we're talking about calculating and understanding the level of change we can do that at a much greater scale than we could do with the previously publicly available data. Um, so really, as Karina was saying, what the, the purpose of this program was is to break down those barriers of access that have previously been in place with commercial data and make this data more accessible but therefore more usable um, to a wider community. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what we mean by that and how that data can be used by so many different users. Um, so this data really is designed to be able to uh, improve modeling, improve understanding of forest management, um, and that goes for deforestation, but could also equally for restoration. Um, we have partners on board now who are much more looking at that topic as well. So I think that's a really interesting for us, um, as Karina also touched upon, how, how we have such a diversity also of applications of the data. So the NICV satellite data program is kind of underpinned by this purpose. The, the purpose is all about the tropical forests. How can we reduce and reverse those tropical for deforestation goals? And as we heard about this morning, that the, the commitments, 10-year commitments to, to uh, deforestation, uh, reversal of deforestation, um, and this, this data program is, is very much kind of sits with it, within that. Um, so how can we use satellite data complementary with other sources of information that we use and how can we empower those on the ground, uh, including indigenous peoples as well, uh, to be able to improve their land management practices and their reporting. So this is the coverage of the program. So nominally, the coverage of the program is between 30 degrees north and south. Um, it's not in a direct straight line because it covers just the tropical forest countries and, and some of those, of course, in, in northern Africa particularly don't have any tropical forests, um, which is why it's a little bit of an odd shape. But, um, but that's, that's the coverage of the program. It's about 45 million square kilometers. Um, and, and as Karina says, about 97 countries. Uh, however, actually the coverage we have just based on how the image data is actually made available is about 103, 100 and, uh, between 103 and 110 countries that are actually included in the, in the imagery. 
Uh, and every time we release an image, and we'll talk a bit about the, the data specifics in a minute, it covers the entire area. So we don't just cover small portions and then uh, you know, keep accumulating in that way. Every time we release a new image, it covers the entire area you see on the screen. I won't touch on this because we've already covered some of these, but it's quite nice as a, as a visual to see some of those, um, some of those uh, impact measurements that, that we've just heard about in, in the welcome. Um, and that's really important for us as a program team uh, to help understand how the data is being used, where it's being used, what applications. And so it's, it's great to see not only user stories that we collect directly from the conversations we have with users, um, but also from the peer-reviewed articles that are now in scientific publications that speak to the use of this data. Um, and so I think it's really empowering to see how much more we're seeing now we are two and a half years into the program. And I think at this point, uh, as we move into the data products, it's, it's important to also uh, tell you a little bit about the partners. Um, who are we? So, so we are uh, KSAT, as, as mentioned. Um, so we are Kongsberg Satellite Services. We're an Earth Observation Satellite Data Provider. Um, and we are working directly with our partners, Planet, who are um, represented on this panel as well by Louisa, but we also have other Planet team members in the audience. Uh, and Planet's data is really the, the bulk of what's being made available in this program. Um, so the data that's being made available from, from Planet is their Planet Scope product, but made into a NICFI designed, um, because it meets their requirements, uh, mosaic, so a continuous image that covers that region that we talked about. And it's just under five meter spatial resolution. Um, and it's provided in the red, green, blue, so visual bands, but also for those who want to do more analysis, is a capability to not only view that imagery in three bands, also four bands, download that data, and do those analyses that you have on the platforms that you prefer to use. And from a cadence perspective, we had, as, uh, as we talked about, the program started in September 2020. It runs until uh, the, uh, September 2024. So every month since September 2020, we've released a new mosaic. And all those monthly mosaics are available to everyone. So if someone joins the program now, they can still go back in time to access those previous mosaics. Not only that, but we also have biannual uh, mosaics, so every six months from 2015 to 2020, which also includes Planet products, uh, starting with Rapid Eye data and then moving into the Planet Scope products, so all still at the five meter spatial resolution. And in addition to that, we also have, <coughs> excuse me, have Airbus data. So Airbus is also a key partner of the program, and they're providing historical data access for a limited number of partners, um, and that goes along with this uh, a different tiered level of access that some of our partners have, and I know some in the room have access to that data also, and you may hear about that from some of our speakers. And this data is provided under a non-commercial license. It's designed to be as open and accessible to everyone. Um, and in doing that, we want to make sure that even if you, ha if, even if you are a commercial uh, organization or even for commercial organizations, they're still able to get some benefit for their internal reporting. And so we do have um, other private sector organizations who have been using this data uh, to this point, as well as, of course, education, research, NGOs, uh, indigenous communities, and, and you know, a lot of you in the room in the forest countries who are using this already. So this is quite a nice, uh, I think a, it's, a, it's a heat map of sorts. Uh, so the darker the green, the more streaming of the data. So this is a, a calculation of statistics just directly from the Planet Explorer platform. So this doesn't take into account the activity that's happening on the other platforms, which I will mention briefly. But as you can see, a hotspots for analysis here are really uh, South America and also Indonesia. Uh, and we see a lot less uh, activity in Africa, and that's something definitely we'd encourage uh, those discussions. We want to hear more from users in Africa and, and how we can collaborate more to ensure that you're able to use the data. And the little inset map that you see there also shows where the users are from, because a lot of the users who are downloading and streaming this data are not necessarily from those countries. Um, so we see hotspots in, in North America, uh, in Europe, but also very much so in Brazil, as you can probably see from the very dark green uh, on the inset map. So how to access the program? Um, we have a QR code on the end slide, so don't 
you don't need to write down this, um, uh, this, this link at this time, but all of our resources for the program are on one single page, and that includes links then to other resources and other um, information such as some of the, the Airbus data as well. Um, so on this page you can sign up for the program, you can ask questions to our help desk, um, you can look at support resources including courses and webinars and other information. So there's quite a wealth of information on this page. And sign up is free, it's free for everyone. Um, and that, as we've, as we've said, this is really designed to meet that purpose. If you're using, if you have a need for use of this data for the purpose of reducing deforestation, I urge you to sign up if you haven't done so. And this is just what the sign-in screen will look like when you get there and how this looks within the platform. So we have um, two tools within Planet, um, Planet's products, if you're not familiar with those. Planet Explorer on the left-hand side, which is the, the baseline visualization tool, has lots of other additional uh, functions that you can use within, the, uh, within the, the, the user interface, which includes changing the color representation, it includes doing screenshots, and so you'll be able to take a very nicely kind of laid out with, with metadata information of timestamps and such like um, of, of a particular area of interest, particularly if you're not so um, used to using GIS. Um, but you can also do indices as well. So if you're looking at vegetation health, if you're looking at those kind of things, those things you can do directly in the platform also. And then in the planet base maps viewer, which is on the right hand side, you're actually able to then download, um, download individual tiles. And if you're looking to download much more, there are some other tools that you can use. And I won't have time to talk about all of that today, but, but needless to say, there's, there's other ways that you can do that through different streaming um, and WMTS links. And we have people in the room from planet who can help answer those more specific technical questions that you might have. And we also have integrations with other GIS tools. Um, Esri and QGIS have a plugin for Planet, and you can use your same login that you would use when you set up, uh, when you sign up for the program, to access the same data sets within these platforms as well. Um, and once the data is released on Planet's platform, it's available everywhere. So you, there's no time lag then to wait for that data to be available in the tool that you prefer to use. Um, and there's lots of other places that you can access the data as well. We'll hear a little bit about um, the Open Forest tools uh, shortly, Global Forest Watch as well, um, Sentinel Hub Restore. I will not talk about all of these, but just to show that there is a lot of other platforms that we know the community are using. Um, and if you don't see a platform here that you're using regularly, come and speak to us. Or we'd be really interested to hear uh, or see if there's a way that we can um, help support you in, in the tools that are helpful for you. And then we have outreach partners as well. So the data is also hosted within Google Earth Engine directly. So you would be able to use your credentials uh, to plan it once you've linked your account, which we have some instructions for how to do. Then you'll be able to access all of the base map data directly through Google Earth Engine also. As I said, we have lots of other resources, so I do encourage you to take a look at the, um, the planet.com slash NICFI page. As I say, we'll have a QR code at the end and you can learn a little bit more then. Uh, and then just finally, before I move on to, uh, to the next speaker, is uh, we also have uh, other, we often get asked about how to cite the data. How do I reference this data program? The data is public, but of course it's still, you know, we want other people to know where, where you've used that, that data. So we do have citation guidelines uh, and we do encourage you to share. Please do share on social media if you're a Twitter user, Instagram user, and, and you can tag the program or LinkedIn. Um, and you can, there are all of the information that you need is all provided in those resources, excuse me, the resources that we have online. So, without uh, further ado, and we'll take some questions at the end, so do take a note of those. I want to pass the floor over to Eric, who's going to give us a demonstration. Eric Lindquist, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody? Day three, Good. the fine, the home stretch. So I have to tell a little story before I do this. I uh, was walking to work ha quite happily this morning in the sunshine, kind of whistling a little tune to myself about how much fun this session is going to be today. 
And I arrive in the office today and find that uh, CEPL, the platform, has experienced one of its probably largest technical failures in the history of the platform <laughs> and is, is down. Uh, so if you've tried to log in to the platform today, I apologize. We have a wee bit of a, it's a tiny problem and we have our top people uh, working on it. But all is not lost. What's that? What? <laughs> Was it you? Was it you? Uh, I mean, it's fun to inspire people to try new things, right? But then this happens. and mm. Anyway, but we have a test. Uh, we have a test server. So we're going to go off the test server. Uh, this is for our internal testing purposes only. So please don't try to sign up for this one. Uh, this is just for the purposes of the demo today. So there were two thirds of the room have ha, are familiar with the NICV Planet. I just quickly, who uses the NICV Planet data or the base maps for analysis purposes, for like analytics? Who uses it for visual, like visual inspection of data or of things? Who uses it to tweet pretty pictures to to people? There we go. Okay, cool. Okay, well, I just, I just want to give a really quick demonstration of how, of how ge generically useful these data are, especially on the analytics side. So to quickly create something uh, like a classification. Uh, it can be done in, I'll be doing the demo today in, in SQL, but it, of course, can be done in, in any geospatial uh, platform, really, including Google Earth Engine. And we will be accessing the, the planet base maps via Google Earth Engine. Uh, in the back, back, behind the scenes here. So the first thing I want to do is just, so I'm inside the CEPL platform. I have registered for NICV Planet data. I have registered for Google Earth Engine. And I have connected my, it's, just, it's a bit of a contorted initial process. But you connect, you, you tell Google Earth Engine that you're a Planet user and you can connect all those things together and access the imagery directly through Earth Engine. And then if you are a CEPL user, you can log in to CEPL. You can add a recipe. You can say, I would like to add a planet mosaic recipe. You can pick any country in the world. Uh, you, oh, you can, sorry. This is better. You can pick any country you'd like in the world. If you pick a country outside of the bounds of the NICV planet, imagery uh, project, then there will be just a black screen. So I would recommend picking one covered by the data. Uh, you can choose, what country should we choose? Fiji. Oh, come on, <laughs> Mohammed. Okay, Fiji. Let's choose Fiji. So we'll go to Fiji. So that we can see the date line issue first hand. <laughs> so we can choose the time period, so as, as uh, uh, Charlotte mentioned we have monthly data available uh, from like these days back to tw 2020 and then before 2020 we have every three months and bef or every six months. Uh, we will take advantage of the monthly data we have available to us and we will do, uh, let's see, we're, we're looking at January to current day to today using NICFI base maps and with luck, we will be taken to Fiji and we will be creating, we will be using the five monthly base maps to make a median uh, pixel composite using the, the data that were available for the, for the last five months. Or, yeah, I think the May, the May data is probably available. The May base map is available, right? Yeah, no, not yet, oh, not yet, May. right, sorry. Still May. <laughs> And so there you are. You have um, your cloud-free, Mohammed. You have your cloud-free. Best pixel composite of uh, of Fiji. So, and you have that, you know, in a matter of a few seconds, really. Um, what you do with that, then you can change the, the way those imagery appear. You can use the natural color or you can use the uh, infrared. Oh, it 
slow. And I guess the, the point I wanted to make here is that not only are they like pretty pretty pictures, but you can actually now do stuff with these data. I'll go back there. I can save this uh, planet Fiji. I can just save that uh, mosaic. And now if I want to do something with that mosaic, I can add another recipe. I can call it classification. I can add that imagery that I just created, Planet Fiji. Um, let's just choose all the bands except for blue and green for sake of, sorry, still not close. Am I too close or not close enough? Am I good? Oh, sorry. Don't tilt my head. Okay. Okay, I got it. I got it. I know, I'm sorry. All my shortcomings are, 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 being, are being on display for you all here today, right now. <laughs> Whew. Oh, is it hot in here? Okay, so quickly, quickly, quickly. So you can just call this, let's just call that forest. We'll just call that other. And then you can, now I'm really self-conscious about where. <laughs> and you can uh, collect, you can collect training data. Oh, wait, sorry. I don't know how to use, oh, I don't know how to use, there we go. So if I want to just, hmm. right, is it, hmm, anyway, sorry, I'm, sh I'm shook up now. Why is it not, anyway. What's that? Okay, thank you. What I wanted to say, and I'm just going to stop here actually, but I wanted to say that these data are, are easily accessible. You can actually use them to do classification, change detection, all at a very high spatial resolution. We're building CCDC assets with the data now, so you can actually then create, from monthly base maps, you can create slices at any point in time during the, during the uh, length of time that the imagery have been acquired and all sorts of really cool stuff. So if you are interested in, in using those data, the SQL platform will someday be working again and you can, you can join that. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I think it's most important that we hear from our country representatives here today about what they've been doing with the data. But it's been a boon, it's been a, it's been a, it has been changing the game for us and how we do things and what we can see. And uh, it's, it's been, uh, just wonderful to work with with this team and with these data and uh, you know thanks to Norway for for making this happen really it's been excellent for forest monitoring thank you done thank you so much Eric and um, pl please do go and speak to Eric if you want to, to learn more and see a demo that isn't doesn't have a time lag because live demos are always uh, a little bit of a challenge so uh, well done for persevering, Eric, and thank you for, for the demonstration. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure, as I said at the start, to, to be able to have three country representatives in person here today. So uh, I would first like to introduce uh, Ximena Herrera, uh, who is a forest specialist uh, at, at the National System Monitoring of Forestry, the SM, SNMB, the Ministry of Forests in Ecuador. So Ximena, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. You can hear me now? No worry. Um, voy a hablar en español, entiendo y hablo un poquito inglés, pero creo que puedo expresarme mejor los detalles que quiero compartir con ustedes en mi propio idioma. 
Y por adelantado, mil disculpas a los traductores, porque a veces cuando me emociono hablando sobre lo que hacemos en Ecuador, hablo un poquito rápido. Voy a tratar de hablar lento para que se pueda traducir. Bueno, entonces les voy a comentar un poco en el contexto de cómo funciona el Sistema Nacional de Monitoreo de Bosques en el Ecuador, porque con este contexto y los antecedentes de cómo funciona el sistema, pues voy a poder hablar un poco más sobre el uso específico que hacemos de las imágenes NICFI. Entonces, en el contexto, eh, mi país en en su superficie de Ecuador continental, tiene alrededor de 24 millones de hectáreas, que es más o menos como el tamaño, lo que vi ahora, de las pitlands de Indonesia. Entonces, es, es un país bastante pequeñito en superficie, pero con una alta diversidad. En ese territorio nosotros tenemos 95 tipos de ecosistemas, de los cuales 65 son ecosistemas boscosos. Adicionalmente tenemos alrededor de 15.000 hectáreas de, eh, no islas, pero sí de superficie marina también, que es parte del territorio. Entonces, con este contexto del Ecuador continental, del Ecuador también con la superficie marina y las islas, pues tenemos varias áreas bajo conservación, que son parte del Sistema Nacional de Áreas Protegidas, bajo el mecanismo también de bosques y vegetación protectores, bajo incentivos a la conservación como el programa sociobosque, áreas pertenecientes a la bajo protección hídrica, áreas de, eh, hídricas en sí, patrimonio forestal estatal, eh, reservas de biosfera y corredores de conectividad. A esto también se suma los acuerdos de uso y custodia manglar del ecosistema manglar. Entonces, alrededor, entre lo que es protegido marítimamente y lo que es protegido en el territorio continental tenemos alrededor del 25% del territorio bajo alguna categoría de conservación o manejo. Y esto ya comienza a presentar algunos retos también para el monitoreo. En este contexto también, ¿no es cierto? Eh, nosotros, de alguna manera, para ir agrupando estos objetos que representan el paisaje y relacionarlos con la normativa vigente, ¿no es cierto? Hablamos nosotros del patrimonio forestal nacional. El patrimonio forestal nacional está conformado no solo por los bosques, sino todos los ecosistemas eh, existentes, herbáceos y, y arbustivos. Y este patrimonio forestal nacional representa alrededor del 58.85% del territorio continental. Eh, la superficie boscosa tenemos alrededor de 12 millones 325 mil millones, eh, 25 millones de hectáreas. Y una superficie boscosa en porcentaje sería el 49.5%. Nosotros eh, hemos tenido, en el monitoreo que hemos hecho, hemos identificado las pérdidas sí, de la cobertura boscosa, pero también estas, estas reducciones por deforestación o los incrementos en la deforestación. Entonces, por ejemplo, el año 2020 es un periodo bastante fuerte por el mismo hecho de la pandemia, las condiciones sociales, eh, los temas relacionados con el uso del paisaje y las condiciones socioeconómicas que nos demuestran que realmente eh, los bosques son muy vulnerables a estos eventos extremos. Eh, también un poco para poner en consideración, porque pueden haber diferentes eh, artículos o diferentes notas de prensa que hablan de que el Ecuador tiene una altísima tasa de deforestación y tal vez tiene algún problema bastante alto con relación al resto de tasas de Sudamérica. Pero también hay que ponerlo esto en el contexto de justo de esa superficie pequeña. ¿Por qué? Porque eh, con relación a su población, ¿no es cierto? Mi país es uno de los países más densamente poblados en toda Sudamérica. Eso significa que la accesibilidad a los bosques, ¿no es cierto?, también representa esto una forma de su uso que los hace vulnerables. Bueno, entonces, en. Eh, para contextualizar otra vez o darle los antecedentes del sistema de monitoreo, ¿no es cierto? Tenemos que las políticas o el ámbito de aplicación están relacionados con esa necesidad de información, tener información que represente ese contexto o esa, esas características del territorio. 
pero están relacionadas también con la gestión y gobernanza forestal, las estrategias nacionales de cambio climático, la estrategia nacional de biodiversidad, todas estas estratégicas, estrategias que después son políticas y que se aplican a través de programas, pues necesitan información no solo para su concepción, sino también para su evaluación de realmente el impacto que están teniendo. Y aparte de eso, también en el Ecuador pues hay espacios, ¿no es cierto?, directamente bajo la competencia de administración del Ministerio del Ambiente. Ya les hablé un poco de lo que son las áreas protegidas o el patrimonio forestal nacional. Y estos se gestionan a través de programas y proyectos, como el sistema de administración forestal, control forestal, un programa que se llama Amazonía sin Fuegos y el Programa Nacional de Restauración del Paisaje. Todos estos también necesitan información desde su inicio, su evaluación en medio término y también para ver cuál es el impacto después a, al tiempo de su implementación. Entonces, con este sentido, en el Ecuador el Sistema Nacional de Monitoreo de Bosques es multipropósito. Y en este contexto de multipropósito también se transforma en un sistema de monitoreo multiescala. Tal vez eso es un tema más familiar con las personas que son geógrafas o cartógrafas, pero es muy importante también tener ese concepto de la escala, porque según la escala la que voy a representar un objeto, también son los insumos y las metodologías con las que puedo aplicarlos. Entonces, eh, nos, nuestro sistema de monitoreo es multiescala, multipropósito, se encarga de eh, generar información a nivel nacional, pero también información a nivel regional e información local, y para eso hay diferentes tipos de métodos, de instrumentos, de herramientas, con las que hacemos ese, ese, ese levantamiento de información. Entonces, ahí viene con el uso de las imágenes, ¿no es cierto?, de NIF, y cómo esto nos ha ayudado ahora. Pues bueno, nosotros estamos haciendo esto, conceptualizando el Sistema Nacional de Monitoreo de Bosques desde el año 2010. Comenzaron con proyectos eh, independientes dentro del ministerio que tienen la competencia de la gestión ambiental. Después, en el 2014, se unieron este, estos proyectos y comenzamos a contextualizar el sistema de monitoreo. En el 2016, ya comenzamos a trabajar como un equipo específico de monitoreo de bosques y de ahí en adelante, para generar diferentes tipos de información, diferentes eh, que han sido usados en reportes y también para la evaluación de políticas. Normalmente, comenzamos con uso de lo que hay disponible. En países como el mío, es muy importante asegurarnos que la generación de los datos esté relacionada también con esa sostenibilidad que yo tengo para implementar, capturar datos de un tipo de insumo. Entonces, eh, gracias, eh, desde hace algún tiempo las imágenes lanzan han sido libres, entonces nuestra principal línea base o nuestro principal eh, insumo o fuente de datos para generar el monitoreo ha sido Landsat, sin embargo Landsat también tiene pues, sus limitaciones y sus bondades, es la serie histórica más antigua que se tiene y constante, pero también tiene la limitación que en países pequeñitos o cuando se quiere identificar objetos pequeños, pues eh, es más difícil hacerlo. Entonces, eh, en el año 2017 comenzamos a hacer este primer uso de las imágenes Planet, realmente para hacer evaluación de la exactitud, de los mapas de cobertura de la tierra que, que generábamos solo hasta ese momento. Entonces, ¿qué utilizábamos? Pues los base map que en ese momento se podía construir, porque eran un número de visualizaciones que podían conectarse a un, a un sistema de información y de, de los diferentes eh, especialistas que trabajaban en el momento para poder evaluar esto. Bueno, y así lo seguimos usando de esta manera en 2018, 2019, sin embargo, en 2020, ¿no es cierto?, eh, Comenzamos a incursionar en una propuesta de cambio de metodología y ahí eh, el uso de, de las imágenes, en una metodología ya no basada en mapas wall to wall, no es cierto, cobertura de la tierra nomás para identificar cambios, sino ya detección directa de cambios. Entonces ya comenzó a utilizarse eh, las imágenes Planet, estos BaseMap mismo, para la evaluación, la evaluación de la exactitud de la detección directa de los cambios. Todo esto pues lo hemos venido trabajando a escala 1 simple. En el 2021, cuando eh, nace esta iniciativa eh, desde el, el programa de satelital de NICFI, ¿no es cierto? Eh, fuimos parte de el poder acceder a una carta de entendimiento donde podamos tener acceso a ese nivel 2 para el uso en procesos de monitoreo de bosques. Entonces, contamos con el uso, unas pocas licencias a nivel de uso nivel 2, con la que comenzamos a trabajar ya más cosas relacionadas con esos otros procesos multipropósito que tiene el sistema de monitoreo. Uno de ellos, tal vez lo pasé muy rápido, pero es, por ejemplo, comenzar a trabajar con los temas de 
eh, monitoreo y seguimiento de los predios o lugares que quieren aplicar un incentivo de libre de deforestación. El Ecuador ha estado apostando en los últimos años en crear eh, estas iniciativas de certificación relacionadas con la producción sostenible y libre de deforestación. Entonces, ahora el monitoreo de ese específico eh, proceso se lo hace con imágenes satelitales de Planet NIFI, ¿no es cierto? Basándonos en esa serie histórica de información que teníamos eh, generada con lanzas, pero sin embargo ya el monitoreo específico de esos precios, pues lo estamos haciendo con Planet NIFI. Eh, bueno, ahí no se actualizó bien la última parte, pero en el 2023 pues estamos eh, incorporando más eh, este uso, por ejemplo, para la evaluación nacional forestal, que es donde está el proceso del inventario nacional forestal en el Ecuador, también es parte del sistema de monitoreo, pues la evaluación de esas unidades de muestreo, de donde tenemos que ir a llegar, ¿no es cierto?, a levantar la información de campo, también se lo hace con ahora ya con, con este tipo de información, antes no la teníamos para las etapas de diseño, pero ahora se están utilizando también en evaluación nacional forestal. Eh, otro proceso también en el que ahora, o al que se orientó también el sistema de monitoreo, es para proveer información sobre el control y seguimiento de la deforestación en territorio. El control forestal es algo bastante importante porque es una acción directa de, de, de controlar qué es lo que está sucediendo en el territorio, ¿no es cierto? Entonces, en el Ecuador, el Sistema Nacional de Monitoreo de Bosques pues, provee información de alertas tempranas que son generados también por diferente tipo de, de insumos disponibles, principalmente radar, validados con información y aterrizados con información de Planet NICFI. ¿Por qué? Porque se están generando muchísimas alertas, pero no todas esas alertas son, son positivas, ¿no es cierto? Hay falsos positivos también. Y el de entregar eso al personal de campo para que vaya y verifique todo eso, pues necesitaríamos un personal muchísimo más extenso y muchísimos más recursos para esa logística. Entonces, en el, con el fin de de que se vayan a los lugares certeros donde hay estos focos de deforestación más reciente, mensuales, quincenales, ¿no es cierto? Se usa también la información de Planet NIFI para validar esa información. Sí, ya, yo creo que sí, solamente me falta ah, los ejemplos, ¿cierto? Entonces, en este sentido de las cosas que les he estado comentando de estos procesos, pues en las líneas de trabajo que explicó Karim, ¿no es cierto?, sobre políticas y uso de la tierra, sobre mercados de carbono y estructuras internacionales, transparencia, mercados libres de deforestación y delitos forestales, pues nosotros estamos utilizando también ya, incorporando esta información hacia el sistema de monitoreo para proveer este tipo de información. Entonces, se verifican, como les decía, cambios de cobertura de la tierra para el distintivo Iniciativa Verde Libre de Deforestación, eh, se hace el control de las áreas de, que tienen permisos de aprovechamiento forestal eh, para identificar cambios mayores de los que se permiten por la extracción del recurso, que no se transforme la extracción del recurso o el manejo en una deforestación. El monitoreo, pues, eh, eso es un ejemplo específico, eh, donde se puede detectar de una mejor manera realmente con estos insumos versus si es que solo utilizamos lanzado Sentinel. Entonces, para el manejo forestal sostenible, el manejo forestal se está utilizando, lo que les comentaba de evaluación nacional forestal, ¿no es cierto? Eh, esto ya nos da la característica de que cuando hicimos el diseño de evaluación nacional forestal, ahora las unidades que vamos a encontrar en Calpo van a tener ya algún tipo de alteración y pues ya estamos comenzando con los análisis de cuánto realmente esto va a impactar en la muestra necesaria para mejorar nuestro segundo proceso de evaluación nacional forestal. El monitoreo del manglar, el manglar es un ecosistema frágil determinado por ley que no se lo puede topar, es decir, no es, tiene unas fundas, unas, perdón, un, unas infracciones, el valor de la infracción y lo que es, eh, eh, la penalización de eso es muy alta, se, es alrededor de 86 mil dólares la hectárea de manglar perdida, eso es, es, esa es la infracción que se está cometiendo, entonces se tiene que monitorear muy bien el ecosistema manglar y también porque el ecosistema manglar, estas áreas de manglar que tenemos en Ecuador, eh, se están incorporando a esto que les comentaba de los acuerdos de uso y manglar, que es áreas donde las comunidades que viven alrededor del manglar pues están extrayendo de manera sostenible los productos como la concha, el cangrejo, algas, para su uso y como uso de bioemprendimientos, que es otra política y otras actividades que se está implementando bastante fuerte en el Ecuador. Eh, le hemos estado utilizando también en, este, en el poder completar los vacíos de información y en la, en la evaluación de la exactitud, ¿sí? de las estimación de emisiones, de, de esta nueva metodología también con la que estamos implementando para estimar las emisiones por deforestación y degradación. Cambiamos ya de esa metodología. De, de monitoreo wall to wall, 
el conteo de píxeles para la estimación de emisiones a una metodología de áreas basadas en muestra. No significa que dejamos de hacer mapas, como les dije, el sistema de monitoreo es multipropósito y hay, por esos propósitos también hay diferentes formas de información con la que se puede hacer. Este tipo de metodologías no son realmente espacialmente explícitas, las áreas basadas en muestra, ¿no es cierto?, sino eh, son más bien una forma pues estadística de robustecer realmente y mejorar las incertidumbres asociadas con la estimación de la emisión del dato de actividad. Sin embargo, para zonificaciones, eh, prospecciones, se necesitan todavía los datos de mapas. Entonces, estamos manejando diferentes tipos de procesos, diferentes tipos de información. Pero ahora estamos utilizando también Plan de NIFI para este tema de vacíos de información. El, las emisiones, la metodología de estimación de emisiones no se basa en el uso de Planet NICFI, porque la serie histórica va mucho más allá de lo que hay disponible, pero se está incorporando de a poco en la metodología. Esto, como les comentaba un poco, los temas de alerta temprana es uno de los principales problemas que tenemos en el Ecuador, realmente con el uso de la información de sensores remotos, de imágenes satelitales, es porque es un, la alta diversidad que tenemos, estos 91 tipos de ecosistemas que tenemos, pues se debe a la cordillera de los Andes, a la influencia de toda esta humedad amazónica y a toda la humedad que viene del Pacífico. Entonces, un país altamente diverso con ecosistemas secos, ecosistemas hiperhúmedos, ecosistemas altoandinos, los páramos, ¿no es cierto? Son, también son otro tipo de turberas que sería importante que yo fui, también los tome en cuenta, nota sentimental este momento para los páramos, pero todo esto tiene el Ecuador. Entonces, también el generar información para poder realizar control directo de dónde está ocurriendo la deforestación, pues es muy importante. Y esto se conjuga con la información que se levanta en campo de las verificaciones y el control forestal. Bueno, esto es parte del equipo que quería mostrarles. Y bueno, la lámina de retos. Retos es cómo nosotros podemos asegurar, ¿no es cierto?, que las metodologías, los procedimientos de monitoreo que se implementen multiescala y multipropósito, ¿no es cierto?, tengan asegurada, asegurada esta disponibilidad de información. Ahora conocemos que Planet NIFI pues, está asegurado un par de años más, eso es muy bueno, nos da la, la oportunidad de seguir explorando e incorporando metodologías con estos insumos, pero también eh, cómo hacemos esto que sea más a largo plazo para países como el mío, donde el, los recursos financieros son bastante pequeños, por eso nosotros apostamos mucho a red más y apostamos muchísimo al tema de pagos por resultados, pues necesita ser bien canalizado, no todo el tiempo vamos a tener nosotros el financiamiento excesivo como para cambiar siempre de metodologías o utilizar nuevos insumos que pueden representar un gasto que no lo puedo sostener en el tiempo. Entonces ese es el, principalmente, el principal reto que tenemos en, aquí en, en el Ecuador con relación al uso de, de información satelital. Pero gracias a estas nuevas iniciativas, pues, lo estamos haciendo, creo que las cosas mejor. Gracias. Eso. Thank you so much, Jimena. I, I can I can agree. I think the the interpreter did a fantastic job because <laughs> um, it was a very very uh, speedy presentation, but you had a lot to cover, and it's uh, certainly very comprehensive the work that Ecuador are doing. So, um, thank you very much. I hope there'll be some some questions and discussion when we get to that point. It's my pleasure now to um, to introduce Sampavi Kyoka. Uh, from Lao PDR, uh, he's part of the Forest Inventory and Planning Division, uh, division sorry, in the Department of Forestry. Sampavi, over to you. Sorry, no, you Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, no translation for Laos. <laughs> okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sumbavi. I'm working at the Forest Inventory and Planning Division, uh, Department of Forestry. Uh, at the start, I would like to introduce where is Laos. You know, some, some, some of you might do, some of you might don't. Uh, Laos is a landlocked country, you know, right in the middle of Southeast Asia, with an area of 20, about 23, 23 million hectares. Uh, based on the latest assessment of forest covers, Lao forest cover, the current forest cover is around uh, 57%. Okay, that's include the plantation. And uh, we have also the follow land, or we call it another one, is called regenerating vegetation, which covering 26% of the country. Yeah? And uh, the strategy, forest strategy of Lao is to reach 70%. So through uh, uh, enhancement forest management, uh, law enforcement, and uh, intensi intensify 
plantation, forest plantation, forest plantation, especially in the production forest area. So, same, same go with Eric. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so, since uh, in 2016, the PM order number 15 to ban the locking, the locking ban was established, and uh, many, many uh, projects in the Laos have collaborated to introduce the law enforcement program uh, by developing the locking monitoring system uh, to control the lock. So, basically, uh, we used the planet before the NICFI program was started. So, the many projects in Laos was collaborating you know, financing to, to procure this satellite data with the high accuracy. Okay. And uh, in 2019, so now uh, with the, the PM, uh, PM number 15 was in place, so the JICA started de developing the uh, near real-time forest monitoring and the MRV, for the first MRV, and we start using the, 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 the planet data. And in 2020, so the start of NICFI program, and Department of Forestry, with collaborating with the JICA, uh, we developed the near real time forest monitoring called Provincial Deforestation Monitoring System uh, using uh, Sentinel 2 and the planet as a monitoring tool. And also the Department of Forest Inspection, which utilized NICFI through the OLDM uh, to monitor the locking area in concession area, to monitor the locking in concession area using NICFI. So the first MMR, uh, forest decoration monitoring level, uh, monthly planets were used to sample based assessment conduct in the using collected online. And also the IGFL post check also assessed the planet level two. So to enhance the transparency in the report. So uh, after the meeting, uh, after the workshop, uh, GFY workshop in Danang, have a chance to talk with Eric. So we requested whether we can have access to level two. So the FAO was greatly provide us with access to level two. And we have been sharing this with the Department of Forestry and the Department of Inspection to use the level two daily. So in our, the future plans, uh, we are planning to use the level two uh, to assist the real-time monitoring. So as the current system, we were able to detect uh, only monthly using Sentinel, uh, only two weeks, every two weeks using Sentinel, sorry. And we verified what we did that with the NICFI in a month uh, yeah, using uh, monthly data from NICFI. But uh, I hope in the future we can get more precise, like uh, Eric Ring, which we present yesterday, where the faster alert can be happened in three days. So we can validate the, the detection of the de uh, deforestation. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce some of the, uh, the, 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 the deforestation monitoring that happened in Laos. So this is the PNMDS uh, Provincial deforest Deforestation Monitoring. So basically, uh, NICFI will be on the provincial side. So the provincial staff will detect, uh, will run the, the system and flag the deforestation. So in, it's in the, in the, okay, in this, this row. And then the, the provincial staff will send the flagged deforestation flag to the district level with coordinating with the villages. Also, this one also used the NICFI as a base to confirm whether this is real deforestation or not, because to reduce the time or the resources to send the, the field team to the wrong place, so we need a little bit precise detection and this one. So uh, we, uh, now the project has expanded to almost all over the country and the provincial staff have access to NICFI level one through both the WMTS streaming or the, the planet table one. And these are the projects that are happening in Laos and we start training for most of the country already. So, so this is the interface of PDMS. So you can see where we flag, so where the, the field team need to go. And when the field team submit the data on the field, it will go back to the central and we store the data with the information on deforestation with the pictures on the field. This is another one, uh, Laos country, we don't have much access in the internet, especially in the rural places. So the offline maps from the application 
using mobile phone and free streaming using the BMTS from the planet is very, very useful here. So we can create an offline map in their phone and they can go directly to the field without the internet. So you can stream very high resolution satellite image on the field. And with level one, we have some issue. Uh, we start training many, many provinces and there is limitation in level one where you cannot download. So maximum, you have limitation in downloading the maps. So after the FAO provided level two access, this issue has been solved. So you can unlimited downloading the maps on the app. So many provinces, many provinces staff, and even district, they can use the offline map on the field. So this is very, 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 very good. And another one is the operational locking degradation monitoring system, or OLDM, call it short. So again, this one has developed mainly on law enforcement to detect illegal locking or to monitor the locking area inside the concession. So uh, basically, again, in the component two, the planet, the planet data was used here, and the field validation, same thing with the previously. Uh, with combination of the uh, delta R and BR to, the, to detect the very small disturbance in canopy, then we confirm with the planet, and then we go to the field whether they see the rocking or not. And uh, for the full information on these two systems, we were presented in a GFOI session in Danang. So you can look back in the website and see the, the full presentation. System. So uh, this is an example of the, you can see the locking area clearly using the planet, huh? on the, the, the yellow circle. And uh, we also monitor the fire. Uh, recently, Laos has counted a lot of uh, fire that caused by the human. So they have no fire break and then fire spread. And we try to assess the damage as soon as possible. But unfortunately, the daily image was so much haze. So we cannot see. So there is some issue with the planet, but, but we still uh, have the high resolution image after the events happen. So we can estimate the, how much area has been burnt uh, virtually. So because the, the team need to know fast you know, how much area has been destroyed by the fire. So uh, let's go to the next step, okay? Uh, to build a framework and connect the alert with the activity data, this is the plan, uh, to, to use this system, these two system, to connect with the activity data for the next reporting, hopefully. And then, and then the upcoming new product we try to utilize, the plan in the field like the alerts, the like MWAS map, hopefully coming soon, and we can access it for, you know, through the NICFI program. And then best access to forest disturbance, we will be able to monitor the forest degradation and the, can track the drivers with a specific cop, which will lead to the EU deforestation free commercial commodity. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sompavi. That was uh, extremely um, fascinating to see the, the collaboration you have, and I think that's something um, that is it's really great to show about this program is the collaboration with the FAO and with other institutions, JICA, you mentioned as well. Um, and I think that's something, maybe it will come up in the questions as well, but there, there are some, some potential opportunities there for further collaboration, either with some of the partners already involved in the program and, and some of the, uh, the more kind of strategic users, such as FAO, particularly for this audience of, of country representatives. Thank you very much. As we move on to the last, but by no means least, speaker in this session, um, I'd like to introduce Brenda uh, Anisia. Um, who is the Remote Sensing Officer for the National Forestry Authority in Uganda. Um, and as we talked about, uh, African countries have, have some of the lower use of the satellite data program, so it's fantastic that you're here, Brenda, and I look forward very much to hearing about your activities with the NICV satellite data program. Okay. <coughs> okay, thank you so much. Like introduced, my name is Brenda. Anichia and I work as a remote sensing officer at National Forestry Authority, Uganda. My presentation will be about the quick work we do at the National Forestry Authority and what we have done so far and how we use planet data. So that's a quick background. 
about NFA. It was established in 2003 under the National Forestry and Tree Planting Act. And NFA, the National Forestry Authority, manages 506 central forest reserves. That, that comes up to 1.2 million hectares. The NFA also prepares vegetation cover maps or land use land cover maps every after two years with the priority based on its mandate to produce forest cover statistics for the country. So the history dates back in 1990 since uh, NFA was producing this data and the data in 1990 was uh, produced using spot imagery. But for the years 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2015 and 17, uh, the approach was Landsat. But going forward from 2019, we have been using a Sentinel due to its better resolution. And also, Sentinel helps us to capture more forests as compared to the Landsat. Because we're interested in the woodlots, the very small woodlots that are about half a hectare. So the activity data and emission factors produced by NFA helps in reporting, national reporting, and also international reporting, by, and also so many government programs. So displayed there are forest types we monitor in Uganda. We have the planted or plantation forests. We have the broad-leaved and the coniferous. On, uh, on the left, it's broad-leaved, and on the right, coniferous. And these are basically just man-made, or like you hear, planted forests. And the tropical high forests, they are those that are well-stocked and low-stocked, or we could call them degraded, but degraded may not be. Because some of them naturally occur like that. It could not be a degradation. It could not be that they have been degraded, but it's a natural occurrence. So the well-stocked are the ones with a closed canopy and they are rich in species biodiversity. And yes, we also have the open, open forests. We call them the wood, woodlands. And these woodlands have shorter trees as compared to the natural tree, uh, natural, I beg your pardon, they are all natural forests, but as compared to the tropical high, these, these woodlands, at least, okay, for, for uh, an area to qualify to be a woodland, it needs to have trees that can attain a height of four meters. Yes, even though the canopy is not so closed, but if we have trees and uh, uh, at least four meters high, yes, they qualify to be forests in Uganda in an area of one hectare. So the woodlands, uh, there are riverine woodlands and there are also dry area woodlands and these dry area woodlands occur mainly in the dry dry areas of the country. So woodlands are classified as closed trees, open trees or very open trees. It can also be classified by stock levels like high, medium, low. So displayed before us there is a land cover maps for Uganda, one for 1990 and 2019. So if we look at the northern the northern part of the country, we can see that we had some good green as compared to 2019. That means Uganda has lost its forests over the years as well. So now applications of NECFI planet data in monitoring forests in Uganda. Uh, we can use, in, U in Uganda we use it for different purposes, collecting training data uh, for our classification purposes, collecting reference data for accurate assessment, validation of our maps. They can be land cover maps or they can be change maps that we get from BFAST or CCDC change. They can be used for preparing field maps, like uh, for ground truthing. We also use them for monitoring restoration and forest deforestation as well. So that is just a snippet of how we adopt planet, NECFI planet data for collecting reference data for accurate assessment. And that is um, 
one for training data collection because uh, CEPAL has given us, through the CEPAL platform, we are able to access these images. At least the advantage of the NECF is that you can select the year. It's not like the Google satellite that you're going to use and you're not probably sure of when you are collecting the information. So we also use it to validate, like I said before, the land cover changes there. The validation is done, has been done within QGIS software, and that is a BFAS change, and Planet NECFI was used to validate the change for that particular area. And uh, monitoring forest, that is uh, one of our central forest reserves in Uganda. It's in the western part of the country, Kagora Central Forest Reserve. Yes, it has really undergone a huge destruction between 2018 and March this year. We can see a, a loss, a very big one, in black around just these areas. Yeah. This part it was a huge loss, and we can also see that there is, re, um, there is a plantation establishment within the same forest reserve. Like some of these areas that were degraded before, they've been planted with the, yes, they've been like planted. So plan, Planet helps us to, to, to generate this information, of course, without having to go on ground. We can get to know that, oh, so at least, yes, it is getting like destroyed, but also there is some intervention that is being taken at the same time. So that is one of our central forest reserves that uh, that is uh, located also in the western side of the country. Okay, in Uganda, most of the forests are in the Albertine region due to the climatic conditions. So most of our tropical high forests are in the Albertine as compared to other parts of the country. There was gold mining in this reserve in 2019, but we can see that in 2022, at least, it, it has stopped. So the forest is regenerating back. So that was, uh, this is for Bugoma, and it's a quick video for, for imagery. It's not going to take so long, it's just a short video. That, starting from uh, March, sorry, starting from 20, 2019, over the years, how the forest has been like changing, mostly in this region. So yeah, this information can be helpful to us to inform the management of what is happening and so that precaution can be taken ahead of time. So that is it. We can see that here has been a huge loss in 2023. So yeah, we have some few challenges with this planet data. There are certain regions in the country that are covered by, that, are, that have clouds, like the mountainous areas. There it is very hard to use this data for monitoring. And also the base maps are a bit heavy for use, like in QGIS, if you don't have very good computer, or if your computing power is not good, you will take some good time to, to load it into your machine. And also, it is not possible for us to know what happened before 2015, but nevertheless, this has been very helpful for us because we had merely no option of uh, validating without going on ground, but NECFI Planet program came in handy and we are able to validate our data. Sometimes, yes, even if we don't go on ground, at least we know we have an alternative. So uh, next steps, in Uga uh, we, we hope that someday we can use Planet to produce our land cover maps. And yes, Eric is here. <laughs> we'll also request him to give us access to the level two as well. So that uh, I, I was yearning to see his illustration because myself have tried to do a classification for my country within CEPAL. I have always failed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brenda. That was that was really fascinating to see to see the work you're doing, and again uh, highlighting the the value of the collaboration and the um, capacity building with with FAO as well. 
Um, so we're, we're, we are on time. We have uh, now time for, for questions. Um, we will run a little bit into the coffee break, but I've been assured by Tom that's allowed because we started a bit late. So we have about 10, 15 minutes um, to take some questions from the floor to anyone on the panel. Um, and I can already see a hand up. So Marco, we'll take your question first and then we'll check with uh, questions and comments online. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Marco Garcia here from Aid Environment, an international NGO. My question will be directed either to Karin or to Luisa, and it's about the continuity of the NICFI program. I assume that many of us uh, here are wondering uh, about the continuity. We saw great examples um, from different countries, and but I'm joining Jimena on uh, as a, coming from from the civil society community. We were very happy to, that the program was extended to 2024, but I assume that, yeah, many of us are wondering what would happen after that. So if you have some insights about it, that would be very interesting to, to know. Thanks. Okay, Karina, are you able to speak to that perhaps? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for the question, which, um, which I expected. And um, we, we've, fully understand that basically everyone is asking that question and and so I'll outline sort of where we are at the moment and um, where we think we can sort of um, take it from there so in short um, where we are is that our current support runs out in September 2024 that's the end of the contract um, our budget situation doesn't allow continuation of support at this level. Um, we believe that it's been a very successful pilot. Even though there is um, another year and a half, we already feel very confident that this uh, has been a really successful pilot and an innovative approach. It's shown huge importance of actually having free access to this uh, high resolution satellite imagery. We're also strengthened in our belief that this should be a global public good. Uh, and especially in light of ongoing climate crisis and nature crisis uh, and the increase in several uses. And we are also encouraged to see that this perspective seems to be shared by a lot of actors, including basically participants at the GFI plenary, um, large partners that we are working with in stopping deforestation, large institutions. We, we, this is our impression, including those that have major or ongoing long-term roles and responsibilities for Earth observation, development of satellite imagery. And throughout this, this understanding, we want to initiate a dialogue with others that would be interested in joining forces to support the global good that, that this satellite imagery is. Um, and, and that's where we are. And so we are, we are saying two things at the same time. Uh, our contract has an end date. We uh, are not in a position to say that we can continue support at that level. We think as a public global good, uh, uh, we wish to initiate a dialogue with those that can play that role. Um, our understanding is also that the uh, EU's the Copernicus program will in their next generation of satellites have high resolution satellite imagery available but only after 2030 and I think that's an important element to take into account and and so um, we encourage all of you to convey this message to anyone you think might be uh, people who should talk to us about this and are in a position to uh, sort of share the responsibilities, perhaps. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Karina. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer, and I think it's certainly one that we also anticipated would probably be asked. So thank you, Marco, for raising it. I think it's important that we get a, a perspective in, in the room and for those listening online. Um, and, and in that regard, if we maybe move online, I don't know, Louisa, if we have any comments or questions. We have about 50 people online listening. Uh, we do. I think we have a lot of comments. Just thank you for the presentations to everyone. Uh, the audience is very pleased and is complimenting you all. Uh, so if you want to see, I don't know if we get the transcripts of the, the chat, but if you want, I can probably get you those. Mm -hmm. 
And we have two questions. One will be for Lao. Now we have more, but uh, one will be for Lao. And it's regarding the setup of your cloud infrastructure and to try to understand a little bit, if you could speak a bit about the effort to set that up and how do you maintain it and how costs and resources are uh, a challenge or not. Yeah, uh, yeah please go. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the question. Okay, uh, uh, the, uh, at the beginning, the basic concept of setting up the forest degradation uh, the provincial uh, or the PDMF system is to make it easy for the provincial and district staff to use. So uh, with this uh, system, you don't need much knowledge of remote sensing. Okay? All the detection will be done by those uh, collaboration with the JICA and the team, the technical team. So the end product is very, very, very easy to use. The guys who are the, the people who, who, who in the province was able to identify the deforestation area and the province was a bit, a little bit of training they can use uh, uh, they can easily use the system and collaborating with the district people and district people that with uh, with the access to the area together with the village team they go to the area and mark the area take the pictures and send back all the data will be collected into the into the uh, the system and, and in the central and we quickly see the result of that so uh, for the challenges is uh, at the beginning uh, like I, I mentioned during the presentation right we have we use the sentinel as a detection tool uh, sentinel have two two weeks gap uh, two, two, two week re revisiting period so then after that we need to verify whether this this is real or not with the planet with the more a high resolution satellite image, but for the monthly NIC fee, so when the when the uh, Sentinel detected, but not the monthly for NIC fee uh, for the planet to detect the same thing, so we get kind of confused with this. And uh, in the future, uh, I have a little bit discussed with Eric how we integrate this into the coding behind and replace the Sentinel coding with the NIC fee daily. So we have more three days, and you have varieties of. Uh, and uh, during the beginning, uh, during yesterday presentation, I think more observer with high, more observer can produce high confidence detection. So that will be very good to reduce the cost on the. Uh, so the main challenge is, uh, I think, uh, for the capacity building. So we need to do a little bit of time with the provinces with many people uses. So we need to identify clearly what they really need on the ground. So we don't, we can, uh, you know, maneuver the resource the right way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sampavi. And um, we will come back to, to the online um, questions. I know there's a couple of others, um, but there's a gentleman at the back. You had your hand up, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Chris Albrecht, European Space Agency. Uh, you talk a lot about high resolution and you know we talked about the sustainability of this programmatic approach and I think it's all about the value proposition and you know I think that the focus on the high spatial resolution is maybe a little bit overshadowing the whole thing um, I mean you you sent you, you showed us early on a, a comparison of a cloudy Landsat image compared to a clear planet image I think this doesn't really do let's say very good justice to the comparison of open data versus the commercial one. I think there's a lot more to the planet data that you could raise here, and it shouldn't be me <laughs> doing the value proposition for planet, but I think it's much more about the high frequency, right, that the data gap filling on the temporal uh, aspects uh, that, that you could focus on, because these monthly mosaics wouldn't be possible in the tropics just using uh, Copernicus or, or Landsat imagery, I assume. That said, I think the long-term value proposition could also be about complementarity, right? You can't do everything with open data, and it's certainly not uh, cost-efficient to do everything with, with commercial data. Um, so especially in the tropics, if you combine Planet and others with you know, open data from Sentinel, from Landsat, but also radar imagery, right, where you, you can address the cloud issue, I think that's where you can aim for a more sustainable approach and I, I haven't really seen this in the discussion today at least so I'm you know just flagging it and putting it out there 
Well, th thank you for your comment. I think it, it's very valid, and um, uh, and yeah, certainly, certainly it wasn't uh, intentional to, to you know, have an have an oversight necessarily on the on the cloud cover issue. I mean, the, the, the high resolution is is important because it's a different level of detail. It provides different types of insights. But as you say, I mean, Planet and perhaps Louisa may wish to comment on this as well, um, as she represents Planet. Um, the the ca the cadence of imagery really allows us to build this continuous mosaic and provide something as cloud free as possible. Um, and then to speak to your point just briefly before maybe I hand to Louisa to comment on, on, the, on, your, on your comment, is related to the radar data. Now, radar is not part of this program, so that's why it's much more focused on optical data. That was um, fully in line with the requirements from, from NICFI as part of this initiative, but absolutely agree with you. Radar is an extremely complementary resource. We know a lot of users are also using radar as part of their analyses, but I think it's important to note that this program is, is providing providing the data and supporting the capacity building and then working with a number of partners who are helping users be able to get the most from the data with the collaboration efforts. But it's an excellent question and Louisa, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. Well, I would even say that Karine may want to add something, but I think we see the program and the data as very complementary. So it's not a one-stop shop for a solution, and all the practitioners are actually the ones that are telling us what they're missing and what they're, where they're finding the challenges and the advantages. And it's an ongoing dialogue, and I think this really speaks to the experimental character of the program as a joint, let's say, global experiment of to what extent higher resolution and higher frequency is bringing us closer to having a solution versus or together with other kinds of data. And we all know we need field data, we need data from all kinds of sensors. Uh, we need a lot of boots on the ground and we know how that connectivity is really important and those operational processes are, uh, which I was really happy to hear about throughout the whole GFOI. So I think this is great. It's great that you're commenting on this and we are definitely also thinking about that and Nikfi for sure, I'm, I am sure. <laughs> and everyone else in this space. And I'll just pass to Karina to comment as well. Yeah, just, just briefly, and, and I agree with Luisa that it's, it's not just the high resolution, it's also the frequency. Um, and uh, as, as, as Luisa also said, that this, this is really a pilot, it's, it's sort of experimental in that sense. Um, we address this because in, in our work at NICFI, primarily through the the dialogue we had with forest countries, we perceive this to be an important bottleneck. That isn't to say that it would solve everything, of course, and, um, but I think we can still now see that it has been very important, that it does open up a lot of possibilities for addressing deforestation that were more difficult before. Um, but again, it's, it's not sort of the end all solution to to all of the issues around forest monitoring. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm conscious of time. We'll take one more question online and one more from the room, I think. Okay, so we have a question for Uganda. And it relates, and I think I, I'm gonna bring it a bit to a higher level because it relates uh, to the use and the consumption of forest wood in household and domestic uses. And I think here the question uh, underlying it is that is related to the drivers of deforestation and to what extent you're finding this kind of data to support you in identifying drivers and how critical that information is in your work as a National Forest Authority. And how easy or hard it is to um, have that kind of data, not only from the remote sensing, but also from the field survey, census, etc. Okay, thank you for the question. Well, I did not present the whole national forestry, sorry, national forest monitoring system for our country, but we have field staff on ground that are employed by the National Forest Authority, and we have a system that we call the National Forest Alert Monitoring System, similar to what Kenya presented. What happens is that there is um, a, a form we design, like for using ArcGIS Survey 1, 2, 3, for them to use using their, their smartphone, and when they are patrolling, if there is anything they, found, they they found on ground, say it's a positive or negative incidence, 
For example, if it's a deforestation thing, they send an alert to us. Because, yes, you can be in the GIS and mapping, but it's not that every day you'll be looking at these reserves. No, it's not true. So they send this information, and we have a, a dashboard. And this, of course, when they send it, it's, it's automatically received at our, at our place, and we're able to view this information, and we're able to know which reserve it is, of course, reported by who and what incidents and all that. And also, if they haven't done that, we have other, other sources of information where we can get the alerts from, for example, from uh, JICA, and also there are many other sources. Yeah, there's Global Forest Watch. We can also send to them to check if there is any, any incidents. So about the drivers, asking about the drivers of deforestation. Yes, I think in Uganda, the main driver of deforestation is uh, subsistence agriculture. Yes, that is from my observation. And I think John Begumana can give us more, but I, I would say it's mainly subsistence agriculture, also commercial agriculture as well. Yes, those I would say those would be the, that would be the main driver of deforestation in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. We have time for one more question from the room. A quick question, uh, the gentleman in white. Thank you, Kai Kalweit from GIZ. I've, I'm currently working in Laos and I've also intensely been working with Ecuador and Uganda a bit more time ago. So thanks for the presentations. My question is sort of now we see in more and more detail what's happening in the forest and how it is disappearing and how quickly it is disappearing. Does it actually also help um, in your observation to gather the political will to actually put people on the ground and sort of generate actions to counter the deforestation? Or is it almost diverting resources um, from towards watching it? Instead, Brenda said, um, we don't have to be on the ground to get the information. So what's, what's your perspective? How does it change the dynamics in your countries? So if we take a quick response from each country, Brenda, perhaps you'd like to respond first. Okay, I didn't really get that question very well, but maybe if you can just summarize. Yes, uh, so I believe the question was related to, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the forest and, and also providing information that could uh, help the, with forest management, and does this mean that we don't need to send people into the field so much anymore, and what's the, what's the perspective? So, sorry, no, the, the question sorry. is, with now all this detailed information, do you see the political will increasing in your countries to actually try to counter the deforestation? And I know it's, it's difficult to answer, but just is it more dynamic now? Uh, okay, let me say support Brenda. Uh, my, I think this is complementary. One, there has, there has always been like a time lag. So by the time you get the field reports, by the time you know that something bad is happening, it's like you are doing post -mortem. But now, evidence is readily available. So it means you can easily engage. Me, I don't think uh, this one deters, uh, or, or deters the institutions to do their work, but it helps them to gather evidence and engage uh, with the authorities and also uh, argue for more resources. Me, I think this is uh, the it, it, it provides the evidence for institutions to argue for more resources. And you know, allocation of resources is always a big, big challenge. And justification for more allocation of resources also uh, without evidence is more difficult, especially uh, after this COVID pandemic and government are struggling to, 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 to prioritize how to allocate resources. Thank you. Sampavi, would you like to comment? Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to <laughs> answer that question. Uh, 
in my opinion, uh, I think in the political views to de counter with the you know deforestation uh, the government has the building in my opinion uh, you can see that from the willingness to uh, you know uh, how to say that uh, increase or the pressure on the technical staff to identify more to work more on detecting this and training the local staff you know and to make awareness of the people that even though they did something in the ground we can monitor those from the above. So the people are aware that we have the tool to monitor it, but, uh, and uh, they also asked to collect the information, especially on the, 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 the damage. Uh, I, 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 there's, there's the names, you know, there's uh, where he lives, but the, on the law enforcement side, uh, I can say there is a willingness to, 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 to enforce the law enforcement in the country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and the final to Ximena. Eh, sí. Podría decir que el uso de información satelital, no solo en plan de NIFI, pero el uso en sí ya de información satelital, de todo este contexto red más que comenzó hace varios años, pues sí cambió un poco el paradigma bastante en el Ecuador, ¿no es cierto? El de enfocarse en la toma de decisiones basada en información. Eso era algo que no se tenía antes. Entonces, eh, sí ha servido mucho a todos los niveles de gobierno. En el Ecuador tenemos el, gobierno, el parte estatal, gobiernos autónomos descentralizados, eh, municipios y el resto de la población a nivel administrativo. Entonces, sí ha habido un cambio a eso a todos los niveles. Sí enfrentamos el mismo reto ¿no? de que ahora hay más información para esa toma de decisiones y también es el reto de cómo integramos esa información, pero cómo conseguimos los recursos para hacer acciones efectivas directamente en el territorio. Ahí es donde el tema de pagos por resultados comienza a tener un mayor peso. Entonces, eh, sí, sí, sí ha ocurrido un cambio de paradigma. Por ejemplo, el caso específico estatal. Antes el proyecto de control forestal, ¿no es cierto?, solo se encargaba de hacer el control de las licencias de aprovechamiento forestal, es decir, que la madera que se extraía bajo una licencia de aprovechamiento enviaba. En el Ecuador no tenemos concesiones forestales o, o, o zonas ya divididas de ordenamiento forestal donde se haga manejo forestal eh, específico hay, por esta ordenación eh, territorial, sino más bien eh, hay áreas donde voluntariamente se quiere hacer el manejo y se solicita también estos permisos para la, la extracción legal de la madera, pero hay otras zonas que no están. Entonces, el proyecto control forestal en su el programa contra el sistema nacional de control forestal pues cambió ya cuando comenzamos a nosotros a tener eh, más información eh, y también bajo otras consideraciones pero el tener mayor información el poder dar decir aquí en esta zona están ocurriendo cambios necesitamos tener acciones efectivas de control en el territorio pues hizo que el programa el sistema perdón de, de control forestal cambiara entonces ya tiene un componente de que no de que no solo revisa las guías o revisa los permisos de aprovechamiento forestal sino que va y hace control forestal en el territorio entonces sí ha habido un, un cambio en el poder tener mayor eh, instrumentos herramientas poder obtener mejor información pero claro eso también nos lleva a más retos porque eh, se incrementa la necesidad también de recursos para atender aunque también tengo una experiencia bastante chévere que es que la gente en una zona dice, ¿y usted, señor, qué hace aquí? A las personas de control forestal. Y les dicen, es que vimos que aquí está ocurriendo un cambio. Entonces la gente es como que, ah, ya están viendo que aquí, que antes no venía porque no habían los recursos para que alguien de la parte estatal vaya a esa zona, pues está yendo. Y saben que es porque ya hay algo que se está viendo desde, desde afuera con otros instrumentos que está direccionando a esa zona. Entonces, poco a poco está, está cambiando eso, pero son muy, es muy útil.